以教你。All right. Hi, everyone. Another AI session, right? Um, welcome to AI Application Forum. Our topic today is AI advancement and application. I'm your host, Nina Ten. I am the co-founder of Data Science uh, Meetup and Data Science Associations, uh, a registered nonprofit in Taiwan, as well as a, an online community of 40,000 members on Facebook. Uh, we dedicated in advancing and connecting talents in the data science field. I'm also a former um, head of market analytics at a firm and then a current leadership coach. Um, today, um, it's really exciting that we're talking about AI. Um, and it's my pleasure to have these um, practitioners to join me on the stage. And together we have Harrison Tan, CEO of Spokio. You might have heard him earlier. So we're gonna deep dive a little bit more on topics that he mentioned earlier. And then we have Christiana Chen, VP of Product at Pluralsight, as well as Ching Feng Su, uh, uh, former VP of Machine Learning at um, HyperScience. Um, so unless you've been living under a rock, which I'm sure you're not, because we're all here talking about AI, uh, you must have noticed that um, AI, this is a topic, has dominated a lot of our conversations in our dinner talks, dinner parties, and dinner with our parents, asking, what is that chat GPT doing? Um, and this rapid advancement really have uh, nothing, being nothing short of a transformation. And so for those of you who actually attended this session last year, you might remember we talked about um, asking ChatGPT, what is the meaning of life? And fast forward 12, 12 months, I was gonna say years, 12 months, um, this technology really has advanced a lot. And so uh, today we're going to talk about, uh, fortunate to have these industry practitioners talk about what has changed, what has advanced, what makes them excited, and what are some things that keep them up at night, as well as some um, recommendations or suggestions for those who are in this field or are trying to get into this field. And without further ado, um, I'm gonna hand over to our panelists to introduce yourself and then talk about, um, tell me, tell us a little bit about yourself and what do you do and how is it related to AI? Harrison, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, yes, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Spokio. I gave a little talk earlier, um, but uh, yeah, my day-to-day -day job is just to help people solve problems and build a better stage for people to shine. I'm Christiana. You hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm Christiana. I'm really glad to be here. I'm the VP of product at Pluralsight. Pluralsight is a technical upskilling platform uh, for people uh, to upskill a lot of tech workforce. Uh, I'm, this is the first time I've been in this forum. I would say that I have been working with AI pretty much my entire life before AI was cool. So I'm really glad that it's got the attention that it has today. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is CF Su. Currently, I serve as a mentor and advisor to some AI staff. And previously, I was the VP of machine learning at HyperScience. Uh, HyperScience is a, a staff based in New York, and we build AI product to help the company, the enterprise, to do, intelligent, to do IDP application. IDP stands for intelligent document processing, and also help them to conduct the back office uh, automations. So before HyperScience, I led multiple machine learning projects in different tech companies in Silicon Valley. So over the years, I have built different applications, and most of them center around search, uh, as serving a content recommendation system, a content recommendation system and, and e-commerce. So it's uh, very, very exciting to be here today to uh, share ideas with other panelists, and thank you for having me here. Yeah, of course. Um, so in the past, first question of today, um, in the past year, um, large language models like ChatGPT has evolved tremendously. Well, personally, when I'm using these language models, I just use multiple of them and compare their results. <laughs> and also validate with search. Chris, uh, Christy, any yeah, thoughts? Yeah, I can follow up with what Harrison has shared. Um, we definitely see a lot of buzz around journey of AI. I would say with the exception of AI services and hardware, where we heard earlier in the AI investment um, forum, uh, I would say it's still too early and too soon to see um, the, the impact of generative AI transforming the entire industries. 
most of the growth uh, falls into one of the two categories, in my opinion. The first one is there is a large adoption and usage of small improvement in efficiency, mostly uh, of, of AI in knowledge work. And a second aspect of it is uh, we're seeing targeted AI project to op um, optimize and transform workflows. And so some of these uh, workflows are just proven to be incompatible with the traditional algorithm algorithmic approach to do that. And one of the great examples of this is data synthesis. And so I would say that both of these underlying currents, they do flow to a future where I think that AI can definitely become more pervasive to a lot more industries. Great, thank you. All right, so uh, I think this is a very good question. I want to kind of add a little bit of historical context. As uh, Harrison mentioned earlier, I think that's an important kind of demarcation point in the development AI. So before uh, the end of 2022, when they announced the JGVT and after, when the gen AI become a buzzword in everyone's uh, vocabulary, right? So AI is already everywhere. For example, in the search, in, in how Facebook determine what you see, what content you see in your Facebook feed or in your Instagram feed. So it's widely adopted in the industry already. There's no question about that. I think that the question is more interesting about okay, what it means by Gen AI and what's the opportunity, what are the vacations. I think Gen AI or large language model is very good at handling a natural language content. Human readable content, it could be a text, could be an audio call, could be a video call. And there's a tremendous opportunity out there because in today's business world, human readable content is the bedrock of the business transaction, right? You are a customer, you apply for a mortgage, you have to communicate with a company, with a bank, with the government. You write something, you submit a form, you, you, you send an email, you pick a form, you call them, right? And even within a company, within the uh, different department, across the department in the bank, in the government agency, you communicate by email, by document. And this is such a good fit for large language model. So for example, my former company, uh, HyperScience, we build AI product to help intelligent document processing. So we do document the text understanding to do document processing to help a lot of automation in the back office workflow. So the idea is that anything an office worker could do with a keyboard and a monitor day, there's a potential Gen AI could help. And let me give you a very specific example. Uh, one is like when you apply for a mortgage. I'm not sure how many of you uh, apply for a mortgage buying a house or buying a uh, car. Of course, you have to fill out the form. You have to fill out how much money you make every year, right? And they are not going to test your word for that. You have to supply a supporting document. You have to submit your pay stub, your tax return, your banking statement. And you can imagine that the, the agent have to collect all the information and just make sure that you are not lying, right? and then present the whole thing to an uh, underwriter before they can approve your loan. But now you can think of that many of the steps can be automated. They could extract uh, your banking statement, your, your tax return to make sure you're consistent with what you say on the application form and make sure you're paying the right tax. Right? And all this actually can be uh, helped and automated to a certain degree by uh, Gen AI. Yeah. yeah, and Qingfeng, you mentioned the very interesting examples of how that uh, AI technology is being implemented in mortgage and, and loan application uh, needs. And I'm also curious, like, if we would double click into a few other examples, so, so other successful examples of AI implementations about what are the applications that are really successful nowadays that we're seeing recently. And I'm curious, can you provide some specific examples, company use cases? that are right now example uh, successful and what were some of the challenges they were able to overcome to be where they are today? Any thoughts? So in addition to that mortgage applications. Yeah, I could add another uh, example here. Uh, this kind of application, some people call it invisible robots. And there's a reason for that because it's different than the physical robot you see in the Tesla factory with a big arm moving the auto parts, right? This is a pure software, and it's already happening in the back office to have a big impact on everyone's daily life, and, but we are not really fully aware of that because they are invisible. One, one example, one of our customer uh, of HyperScience is a government agency. They process the application for a certain type of benefit. Uh, I cannot name them here in the public forum. 
And typically, the applicant, the applicant will have a submit a request for benefit and provide lots of documents, including medical notes and, and some kind of supporting document and the, the basic that to support the financial hardship they are in. And I was told usually it take several hundred pages of document. And you can imagine if you are the people uh, have to process application, it's going to be a daunting job. Just go through all the document, make sure there's no mistake, there's no duplicate, and there's a back and forth. And it took take six months or even uh, up to a year to approve a financial benefit to this family. And I was told that by applying some technology, so the intelligent document processing powered by Gen AI, they could significantly cut down the application time uh, from a month to just uh, less than a week. So those are like very, very tangible, very beneficial example of a Gen AI being used today in the society. Any other examples to add? I I would say that you know there are three industries I want to kind of call out attention uh, because I do think that they they they're usually being talked about the most. I would say the first example is is manufacturing. Um, when we think about manufacturing, I would say it remains to, to be one of the more challenging industries to implement generative AI, not so much of a traditional AI. And the reason for that is that capital equipment um, replenishment cycle is very long and is also very expensive. So workflows that uh, CFP talked about earlier, workflows that are embedded in the design to be part of the manufacturing process have already been established. And so it's quite difficult to kind of rip that process out and replace it with a generative AI version of it. So I would say that there's a lot more applications that can definitely apply to the back office in manufacturing, but the use of generative AI in sort of production line is kind of remains further on, on the time horizon. The other two industry I do actually think is more ripe for disruption for applying generative AI. Um, the first one is healthcare and the other one is finance. Uh, both of it because they have large uh, amount of data sets uh, as well as high labor cost. Um, I would say that, you know, unfortunately the iterative and exploratory nature of technology development is one that is in direct conflict of the more rigorous and structured thinking that is required for the underlying mechanism for, for, these, uh, for these two industries. So uh, what this means is that the, I would say the consequences of inaccuracy is a huge impediment uh, to Im implementing these successfully in finance and in healthcare industry. And so is the cynicism among the scientists and the medical professionals uh, who may perceive that generative AI probably is still sort of non-deterministic and speculative. That being said, I do think that, you know, you know, with Pluralsight, for example, we're seeing a lot of interest from the healthcare industry as well as the finance industry who really want to make sure that they can train their workforce to understand how to, uh, you know, process the large amount of information they have, how they're able to create better service and product for their customers. And so without going into details, I would say that if you work in any of these two industries, definitely look for opportunity over there because I think Journey of AI is yet to, we would yet to see the impact that you can create in those two spaces. Yeah, and, and I think those are a really good tee up for our next question, which is we talked about what's being successful, what's being really popularized in, right now, and what are some of the successful examples in mortgage, in healthcare, in uh, finance. And so looking ahead, I'm curious, at the application or even market layer, uh, what do you see are some of the biggest opportunities or problems that have not been addressed that should and has the opportunity to be addressed? I know Harrison earlier you talked about fraud, you talked about division, you talked about uh, was centralization. Um, so also curious to, to, to hear from you now being in those industry and then being in the, this field, what are some of those opportunities that you see? Uh, in regards to Gen AI, is that right? Gen AI, AI. Okay. Well, let me talk about the classical machine learning first, and then I'll talk about the Gen AI, uh, especially uh, large language models. So in classical machine learning in my industry, the data industry, um, like people use it to build what, what they call decision intelligence and decision science. Essentially, it's a fancy way of saying you create a model that spits out, yes, yes, do something, no, don't do something, maybe do a manual review. Essentially, that's what it does. And so there's a lot of uh, things like propensity scores, right? Um, uh, credit score is a more complicated version of that and all that stuff. And these kind of machine learning models 
Actually, back in 2015 or so, uh, people have been trying to use neural networks uh, to actually create these models, and they have what's called an overfit issue. So overfit is when the model just copies the data instead of uncovering the generalized pattern because you create a lot of uh, parameters. In other words, the general rule of thumb, the way I think of it is if you're, let's say you have a table and the uh, row is uh, observation and record, columns is the features and attributes. If you don't have enough columns, uh, using a very complex model like neural network will actually have overfit issues. And so most of the time to sum up in classical machine learning in my industry, uh, the issue is your data does not have enough dimensions or features. So most of the time when you create, uh, use uh, complex models, techniques, it actually uh, does, does not do predictions very, very well. So that's on the classical machine learning side. On Gen AI side, um, I think one of the big industries that we didn't mention here is marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the reason is because at the end of the day, uh, marketing is about connecting people, right? It's a connecting brands to users, essentially. And uh, Gen AI is very, very good at communications. I'll give a couple uh, very concrete examples. So nowadays, when you want to buy ads on big platforms such as Google, uh, they use AI, right, machine learning algorithms to actually, so you just, you just give them a bunch of creatives, let's say ads, right, uh, image ads. And then they'll use AI and machine learning to optimize and find the best version. Uh, so previously, we had to upload all these images and all that stuff. Now you just use Gen AI, one of those things, to create thousands and tens of thousands automatically and give it to Google. In other words, you're using AI to fight AI, right? So <laughs> that's one, one great example. It actually works. Uh, it actually works better at images. Like, for example, you give them different kind of frames and then girls, uh, Women, men, and different variations just creates like thousands of variations and just let Google decide which one is good or not. Image worked really, really well. Text, not, not so much, but still, you know, this kind of applications and marketing applications, I think is a great example of where Gen AI can shine. Yeah, I, I could uh, add a couple more. Um, I think uh, as uh, Harrison mentioned, that is like a more classical uh, machine learning application like AI. I already mentioned that uh, using that to build recommendation system is a very powerful one. You find it everywhere in your daily life, right? In search, in, in your Facebook feed. So uh, I can point three relevant area when it comes to Gen AI. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the large language model is very powerful. It's a good fit for any application that touch the human readable content. So the first area I think that could be very powerful and you can see it already maybe on the horizon is uh, any communication box, right? So you, you can find this uh, virtual assistant today already taking care of customer service or uh, you can try to ask question like what's the meaning of life and all these. So you can even have a coach or you have just like virtual assistant. So I think that there are lots of companies doing that already and I believe that it's actually very powerful. You could, even go specialize in, for example, you can build a special application to help to spend time with an aging, uh, your aging parent or someone suffering from dementia. You can keep, just keep them company, right? And even you can, already there's an app already can help you uh, just find your virtual girlfriend, virtual boyfriend, right? Just like you have a virtual date, right? So this is a communication bot will be a very important area, I think. The second area I think will be you start having conversation or have a special interactions with the human readable content. Well, right now, you have 100 pages. For example, for all the public company in the United States, you have to submit a financial statement to SEC, and one of them is called 10K, right? And it's like 50 page, 100 page long. And sometimes, all the investors, or we just have a, a, a forum discussion, AI investment, all the investors, you are supposed to read it. So do your research, do your homework, but it's 100 pages. Right, so how can you find the time to come to get some important information? And now with the large language model, the Gen AI, you can just ask a question. Can you tell me what's the revenue growth in the past two years from Apple? Or what's the risk, potential management risk uh, from NVIDIA, right? So you can just query against the document. So it's going forward, they are, well, are going to have a lot of opportunity to interact with this human readable content, either to ask, to search, to summarize, or ask them to generate. 
you give them a pump, they will pen a picture for you, right? You describe something you want, uh, you will create a design. So I think that's the second area. And the third area, I think, is going to be very powerful fit with uh, Gen AI's agent. Uh, it's something that a core a component that will carry out task on your behalf. Or it could be a co-pilot model, right? It doesn't have to be completely taken over. Like many companies, including Microsoft, they are promoting a co-pilot co uh, model. I think this is going to be a very important productivity boost uh, to many office workers. So that's kind of my uh, prediction, that like, three area uh, for Gen AI application. I want to add a, a quick comment uh, to what you said about 10K and also maybe uh, just one, uh, one more example before we move on to the next question. So if you're using 10K uh, and ask uh, uh, questions, make sure you check across Gemini, OpenAI, and Microsoft Copilot because they'll give you different answers. I hope that they fix it, but make sure you kind of check it. Kind yeah, of yeah that, that's why I said earlier, I actually have three different bots open and ask. Totally, and yes. Google search is always very helpful. Yes. Uh, I would say, you know, you talk about Gen AI is most ap applicable to human readable content, and I think it can be more true to that. Uh, you know, it's very important for us to identify the problems that you want to solve first, because as one of my professors in the past have said, 90% of the problems uh, can be solved with linear regression. Uh, so don't definitely don't overkill that with uh, with Gen AI. And there's one more applications that uh, I would like to just just touch on very quickly. It's it, it's in the content creation world. So at Plurisa, as you know, we create our own courses and curriculum to upskill tech workforces. And so it is a huge opportunity for us to really look into how generative AI can help us improve our curriculum and content better. And so we have assessment for different kind of technical areas. And one of the great, uh, I would say, interesting problem that we have come across from our customer is when we have assessments, our, our customers or our employees who are taking the trainings are actually copying the questions and putting in one of these Gen AI bots and just ask it to come up with an answer. Uh, that actually presents a very interesting problem for us because now we have to design a problem in the assessment where we are kind of combating this problem that we see from our learners, which is they're essentially sort of find an easy access to get to the answers. But fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, a lot of these different bots, Gemini, OpenAI, and even Microsoft Copilot, they do give different answers at this point. And sometimes they're correct, sometimes they're not, not correct just yet. Yeah, um, especially these communicative kind of chat bots. I think I also resonate, especially what uh, Qingfeng, you mentioned earlier, the communication agents where um, that reminded and you talked about marketing that reminded me when I was doing marketing analytics a lot of time me or my team is actually plagued by uh, when not knowing when to answer our stakeholders questions in slack and maybe we can build agent and then just replicate ourselves and then given some uh, directive and say hey do you want to answer right now or not and wait for me when I come back or do you want to answer right now here's the the library of answers I've written down for you versus the person actually in front of the Slack message answering it. The boss won't like it though. Well, just don't tell the boss. <laughs> don't tell the boss. You have to train yourself first so then it sounds like you. Yeah, the, bo the boss has his own agent. Yes, maybe the boss will ha has, has their own agent, exactly. Um, okay, so now, so far we talked about today, we talked about a little bit uh, tomorrow, and shifting gears a little bit, um, last month, and we're gonna talk about governments, uh, governance and then risk, um, last, uh, last month, OpenAI and Anthropics enter an AI agreement with U.S. Uh, safety, um, AI Safety Institute. So giving access to these uh, major model releases before, um, for a testing and evaluation purpose. So really that signified the importance, importance of governance and evaluation. And so, but however, a lot of time, um, people actually don't necessarily agree with, with that direction. So I'm also curious, um, give, say, get, saying that, given that, what are some unpopular opinions that you have regarding um, AI applications or this field? Or maybe even what are some of the things that related to AI or this technology, how that will evolve that's keeping you up at night? Other than for Harrison, like your son, who's crying at night. Um, so yeah, I'm curious to hear that. All right, I'll start. So uh, first of all, I think uh, I'll, I'll answer in two, two, uh, two answers. Um, so first of all, one of the things that worries me is definitely bias. Um, I think uh, as we rely more and more into these tools, uh, you know, uh, and people 
uh, take it as the truth. Uh, they didn't really ask the question of how it works, right? And uh, uh, they will uh, inevitably did not detect the inherent biases in data. Um, by definition, uh, a single datum is subjective because it comes from a single entity, right? Uh, data is the voice of an entity, whether it's a human or a device and so on and so on. So by definition, a datum is subjective. Um, small data is biased. And large data, only because the law of large numbers and central limit theorem uh, in statistics, frequentist statistics, if you believe in that, <laughs> then you have objectivity, okay? So most of the time, uh, because of the big data, you have objective, but then when you do personalizations and segmentations, well, guess what? That data is no longer that big. It becomes small data, and small data all have biases. So I think that's the thing that uh, I just want to uh, mention, but that's not super controversial. So you were asking what I worry about and uh, what's controversial. Um, I'll talk about the controversial one, and I think half of you guys probably will hate me because it's controversial. <clears throat> I actually do not believe in uh, AGI, and artificial general intelligence, that most people define it as is. As, um, if you define artificial general intelligence as a general purpose, multimodal, artificial intelligence model, then I think it's here, right? So I mean, the, the models that we see here today, it's not just language generation, it's also image, video, audio, so on, so on, so on. So if you define that as artificial general intelligence, I think it's here or almost here. But that said, is that true human intelligence? Right. Underlying neural networks, the single, uh, the activation fun functions, right, in the uh, neuron, uh, is, is human neurons really activated based on sigmoid functions? Is this, I don't know, it's kind of weird, right? And uh, also, if you look at most of these approaches, it requires a huge amount of data, and humans don't need that, in my opinion, right? And how we think about it actually is more Bayesian approach, right? So what's Bayesian approach? It goes from state A to state B using conditional probabilities, we don't think of it as frequentists trying to get millions of observations to predict the underlying distribution. That's not how humans work. So for those kind of reasons, if you define AGI as superhuman, human-like intelligence, I don't, think, I don't think it's here. Yeah. I'll add to that. Um, I would say that the other, I would say another unpopular opinion uh, that I think is there's a lot of hand wringing in among corporations around data confidentiality. And one of the knee jerk reaction is to bring a lot of these training and data set back to on premise solution and data centers. And so I see this as a brute force uh, solution to address data security and, and compliance. Um, there is, you know, it, it is one of the reasons that I would say plague the early the deployment and adoption of LLM models, there's really no reason to say that a lot of our, you know, we cannot deploy AI or cloud deployments in a secure fashion, right? A lot of the top cloud services out there, they their service do meet the current Department of Defense compliance requirements for data isolation. And so I would say that, you know, when we're thinking about deploying whether it is, you know, our, a solution that's specific for the company, you know, investigate some of the, the solutions that are existing out there. And for the data confidentiality and privacy, read about the, 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 what the requirements are from the service provider, because oftentimes they can be a much effective cost measured and help you get the product out to the market much faster. All right, so my unpopular opinion is actually similar to what Harry just say, I also don't believe uh, in like AGI, artificial general intelligence, is a threat to our humanity. And in particular, I think some people worry about one day we'll reach the singularity where a machine will just take over and we human beings become a slave. And I just don't believe that. I feel like in general, collectively, we are smart enough to make sure we are always in control and to get ahead of the machine. And so having said that, so the next Part of the question is that what worry me? I, I do have some immediate or short-term worry, and I think there are three of them. The first one is 
I think Harris also uh, kind of touched upon that is a transparency and explainability of the, our machine learning model, right? So some of the large range model is very easy to get to 100 million parameters. It's so complicated. Sometimes you just don't know why certain behavior will happen and why the chatbot will tell you something like that. And this is actually an active research problem. And so many companies, they, they work on this so-called uh, using human feedback, right? And using the alignment and make sure the, the output of the large range model will align with our, our society value about the law legal system and with our culture and also on so, so forth. And also we, we talk about financial, healthcare industry are good fit for um, large range model for Gen AI, but also this industry happened to be heavily regulated. So you, you cannot do stupid things and say stupid things to a customer. Otherwise, uh, all, all the bad things could happen. Right? So uh, transparency, explainability is a big issue, so they worry me. Second one is also obvious, is like I, I, I'm concerned about the situation of winner take all. So we talk about large range model and actually very small number of company are able to uh, build large language model from scratch. Not only money, I mean, you can fall in time, I mean, all the money you have, but it, it requires special knowledge and know-how. And it's a very small number of engineers that they actually know how to just really manage the, the whole training process. It takes six months to, or even longer to build uh, the model. And I'm very concerned about lack of competition, right? In the marketplace, in the ecosystem, we only have like less than five companies are able to do that. Uh, what do we do with the other small size and mid-sized company? And, and third one is probably also obvious to, to some of you is Gen AI is good at generating human readable content, right? So all this fake news, fake misinformation is very worrisome uh, because can you imagine that you cannot trust uh, all the media you, you listen to, you read, or you watch uh, on the online right now? When you got an email, when you see something on your Facebook feed, he just couldn't trust it. And if we have a trust issue in our society, I think all, all the issues just like break apart. And just think of the upcoming election is a, a, a testing case for that. So I think I'm worried about these three things immediately, but I'm not worried about uh, singularity or AGI uh, will, will, will kill all the humanity, so. What about ASI? <laughs> Artificial superintelligence. Um, but yeah, uh, Qingfeng, you mentioned and echoing what Harrison talked about, which uh, was really that trust, that trust and ultimately division of the different eco chambers and how that's reinforcing that mistrust and how people are just away from each other and not really want to come together and then solve challenges and problems together. Um, so I think that is a little bit segued into our last question today, um, which is, so knowing that this technology has been evolving so rapidly and it's touching different fields and, and disciplines, um, it's no longer just one tool for one purpose. It's no longer just coding or algorithm. It's no longer just go to learn about SQL or Python or how machine learning model works. Um, we're surrounded by a lot more technologies and tools in our daily life as well as our workplace. So I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience who are currently in the data science AI field or who are trying to transition or moving into this field. And so I'm curious for those of that are in there or continue to grow, what do you think having this kind of discipline, this interdisciplinary knowledge, how is it, how important is it? And also, if it's important, what are some of the fields that you would recommend people to get familiarized with to ensure that going forward they can implement technology or do their job and work successfully? I can start us off. Um, first of all, yes, uh, it's very beneficial to have multidisciplinary team. Uh, I would say that it's very tempting to kind of wave the AI magic wand to of LLM specifically to solve every problem. Today, the reality is that smaller models can probably already solve the problems that you have and face at the organization. And so one of the roles in particular, uh, I would say is machine learning architect has emerged as a role that is really beneficial in breaking down some of the larger complex problem into a smaller one that we can actively tackle, essentially. And so with each AI deployment, um, we need to find a right balance among data availabilities, low balancing, question, uh, and QAs, and operations, 
ethics, right? A lot of these things taking order that may be unique to a particular industry or even maybe bespoke to a particular organization. And so when you, when you think about these, you know, a lot of the areas I just talked about, there's so many different career pathways and roles that you can be part of in order to create uh, the, the right solution uh, for your company. And so a, a team of multidisciplinary people is going to really be beneficial to help create that custom solutions. And so I think that's a very important aspect of it is that start understanding how, what problems that your organization face and what aspect of it can you contribute to that because I think it's so critical for us to have that balanced view when we create that solution. Further thoughts? Yeah, well, I would like to say that I think large language models is inherently interdisciplinary, right? It's uh, basically not just computer science, but it's also uh, language, literature, and those kind of things. I mean, if I have a deeper appreciations for Shakespeare as opposed to like Einstein and Maxwell, then I would do a lot better than <laughs> better today, right? I would be the one who actually helped build this model as opposed to just solving the problem of identity uh, forever. So, so I think at the end of the day, um, you know, it is a, uh, you require all these disciplinary approaches to get inspirations from uh, one field to the other. Uh, for example, uh, I gave a talk earlier uh, in another venue in regards to what is truth, right? And uh, how do you actually solve misinformation, disinformation? Uh, and where I get the inspiration from is actually in philosophy, right? In philosophy, there's something called criteria of truth. Uh, there's multiple criteria, as you can uh, read up from Wikipedia, like cons uh, uh, consensus, that's what blockchain use, right? Majority rule, coherence, authority, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but those are not learned from computer science, right? So you get inspirations from different places. Um, and uh, sometimes when you actually go into something, go into a field, you lead to a dead end and you just have to change. Like my undergrad uh, specialty is in optics. I mean, optics, uh, what I learned, like Fourier transforms and optics, I, I use none of that today, right? So, so you know, that, that is uh, kind of that end. But sometimes you lead to that end, sometimes you lead to a huge uh, surprise. So at the end of the day, uh, for me, it's, my advice is uh, just always have a good attitude, right? And that attitude is, uh, you know, have that, see challenges, right, as opportunity to grow. Don't, don't always like, hey, here's a challenge, here's a problem, and run away from it, right? And then if you're good at solving problems, solving, tackle, tackling challenges. The next big problem, and even I have to learn, is how do you find good problems to solve? Because at the end of the day, there's so millions of problems. You can't solve all of them by yourself in your lifetime, right? So how do you actually find good problems to solve? How do you actually define the definition of good and definition of success for yourself? Now that's a lifelong lesson even for myself. How do you define good? <laughs> or are we... <laughs> If it's going too inward, then yeah. Well, for me, it, it's a it's a very subjective thing. Like uh, for me, it's not just monetary, uh, as you can kind of tell from the way I talk. I love uh, solving intellectual problems. Um, so uh, most recently, for example, if you guys, uh, some of you guys are security experts, I finally got why uh, BBS uh, anyway derived cryptography is very, very important. So I, I, got, I got a kick out of it. I was like, oh, this is make my week. So for me, the good is not just about monetary, right? It's a mix of monetary and self-joy. Hmm. So the values that you care, and then one thing that you mentioned is this intellectual pursuit yes. is what is fine or good. Qingfeng, what about you? What other advices you have? Oh, okay. I think the AI or Gen AI in particular is very hard these days. So it's very reasonable, very natural for you to jump onto the bandwagon. And my suggestion is that you do not need to become a machine learning engineer to, to accomplish that. It's ML or AI is just a tool, right? And then its application is, uh, is very important. I mean, I would say uh, as important as the fundamental of the tool itself. I use this analogy of mobile internet. I think some of the... Uh, speech earlier today, they compare AI, uh, evolution compared to internet and, and mobile. So uh, mobile internet is everywhere, right? So we use it 
in many, many different parts of our life, but very few of us become expert in radio frequency or, or wireless transmission or the spectrum or all the, all the detail. And a lot more is on how you figure out how you move your product, your service, your application to mobile internet uh, from a traditional web. So your service become available anytime, anywhere, 24 seven. And I can't, I can't expect the, the adoption of AI is going to follow a similar path. Right? So this is such a widespread application possible with the Gen AI. So it doesn't matter which industry you are in, I think there's a potential, you should look inside, become an expert with your problem, right? Understand the pain point of your customer, and then try the opportunity to try it out. Because it's so easy to play with the Gen AI today, open an account on OpenAI, or just try it for free on Microsoft. Get a taste of it, right? And to see whether you can solve your existing problem with the new technology and, and start from there. That would be my suggestion. Don't, don't worry about going back to school and get a master in machine learning. That's not a very a wise investment on your time and money. <laughs> right? uh, I would rather just you play with it and try to solve your existing problem with a new tool. Yeah. Sorry, I want to add something. Uh, most recently, in regards to your comments about don't worry about uh, getting an ML degree or something, I recently had a uh, discussion with our hiring manager. I said, I would want to find someone, because back in the day when we go to school, there's no data science majors, right? So I was like, I would love to find someone who knows about machine learning, right, or PySpark or those kind of things, but they're not in the field because that shows that you have that self-initiative to teach yourself. So I would rather do that. That's a, I would rather find those kind of people who has the competencies because, like, for example, if you want to, most recently, this literally happened, if you're wondering about what's the difference between table and data frames, like literally, you just go to like go to like ChatGPT or yeah, <laughs> it'll just tell you tell that. Tell you a better answer. That's right. That's right. So it's about how you solve problems. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to echo what the CF said. Yeah. Yeah. So really, it's become a problem solver. Be curious and know your north star. While you're pursuing intellectual or finance, whatever, just know what that clarity is. And then become the person who can synergize, who can bring these experts together without being the experts. So you know enough to be dangerous, but you're not that dangerous in that field. But just bring those dangerous, those, yeah, those, those badass to the field. Okay, well, so that's that. And thank you so much, all the panelists here today to talk about AI today, tomorrow, risk, and what's some advice uh, for the audience here. And uh, please give me, join me, welcome, give me an applause for our uh, panelists today. And thank you so, mu so much. And please stick around. Uh, we have lunch outside and also a lot of the panel panels and discussions in, uh, in the afternoon. And I really hope that our session today brought, has brought you some inspirations and new perspective. And thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs>